A sacrificial ceremony in Shishuanbana, South Yunnan, launched the spring tea harvest. This was the beginning of our journey along China's ancient tea road. The wild tea tree originated in the valley of the Six Tea Mountains. The idea of infusing the broad leaves in boiling water originated here too, probably around 3,000 years ago. The prized Pu'er tea, named after a local market town, became the area's economic base. Tea plantations were cultivated. Each village perfected its unique method of production, pressing the tea into dense cakes for easier transportation. But the tea growers had to find a market, and it was Tibet that craved their tea. The Tibetan plateau lacked vegetables, and mixed with yak butter, tea balanced their diet of fatty meat. That's how the caravan route called the Tea and Horse Road came into being more than a thousand years ago. The caravans trudged to and from Lhasa, the main merchant center, more than 4,000 kilometers each way over 20 mountain chains crossing four great rivers. We have met people who still run the caravan trade, and we have seen how the tea road was and still is the means by which peoples and cultures migrated and intermingled, how ceremonies and festivals were adopted far from their place of origin. We have climbed narrow and dangerous paths to the salt wells of Yanjing. We entered into the mystical land of Shangri-La and witnessed occult religious ceremonies to drive away evil spirits. And now we set off on the last leg of the journey to the roof of the world, into the calm region of Tibet, with two months of road still before us. the skirts of the Himalayas, altitude 4,000 meters. Prayer flags called wind horses are hung here. They're messages of goodwill distributed by the winds. The air is thin, and the horses are not able to cover the ground as before. Their harnesses must be loosened so as not to restrict their breathing. In the sunshine, the temperatures are reasonable, but hats and thick garments are needed for protection against the ultraviolet rays. At night, a terrible chill settles over the ground. Stops must be frequent and long. It is the acclimatized Tibetans who fare best on this last stage. The welfare of the men and horses is the caravan leader's main priority. The caravan leader was responsible for the meals. It was he who fed the ordinary horse drivers. They would find several stones which they'd put around the fire to make a stove. They'd sit around in a circle to eat pre-cooked meals which they'd warmed up. The quantity of food was carefully measured in handfuls by the caravan leader and he served it equally. He was the last to take food for himself because on the T road the drivers and the leaders took the same risks and considered themselves equals. They say that if a Tibetan misses tea for two days, he will become ill. Tibetan butter tea is made from pu'er tea, salt, and a knob of yak butter. It heats the body and provides the calories needed for physical effort. But it also helps the digestion of meats and cleans the body of the lactic acids that accumulate at these heights. Litang appears like an oasis in the mountain desert. With some 46,000 people, it is the only reasonably sized town in the region. It claims to be the highest town in the world. 
Most caravans pass by here to rest and restock. Thank you, Litang is an especially holy site. Of the 14 Dalai Lamas, or reincarnated leaders, that have existed in the history of Tibetan Buddhism, two were born here. A mountain of prayer stones lies alongside the Litang Monastery. Each stone is marked with one of the six holy words of Tibetan Buddhism. Every parting voyager leaves a stone to ensure a safe arrival. With six weeks still to go to reach Lhasa, the horse drivers need all the assurance they can get. There are four main schools of Tibetan Buddhism, or Lamaism as it is often called. The word Lama signifies wise man. The yellow hats belong to the Galupa school, the school of the Dalai Lamas, and they want to transmit their learning so that all can reach the sublime state. Others are more introverted, seeking their own serene route to spiritual perfection. Man and nature and the spirit world, indivisible in the same universe. Remote communities of Lamas had to find the means to exist in the material world. They ran their own caravans along the T Road. Monk Zhu was both a Lama and caravan driver. I've been at this Lamasery since I was 13 years old, and I worked for the Lamasery's own caravan. We went to India and to Nepal, mainly transporting tea and cloth. While crossing Tibet, we'd exchange the tea for yak butter. We'd exchange one cake of tea for two cakes of yak butter. Every three years, the Lamasery would select four new Lamas to be in charge of trading for the Lamasery. They would go to Zhongdiang, now called Shangri-La, to Jiaguang, and to Kunming to purchase brown sugar, rice, tea, and other products. Then we transport them by caravan to Lhasa to resell. In this way, we covered the daily expenses of the Lamasri. Today, there are still four Lama housekeepers charged with such trading to feed the Lamasari. But there are only 60 Lamas to feed and clothe now, compared with 200 a few years ago. Until recently, the scale of horse caravanning was very great. Normally, one trader would have at least 50 horses, and he needed five men to drive them. We faced many difficulties along the way. We came across bandits, and we'd suffer from the lack of water. It was extremely dangerous in winter. Summer was obviously better. I'm 82 now, but I still remember those days very vividly. <laughs> Two centuries ago, this four-meter-wide iron teapot was brought from India in pieces so it could be carried by horses. It was rebuilt at the monastery and is the precious centerpiece of all ceremonies. Litang has developed and modernized, yet it still cherishes its reputation as a service station on the T Road. Many horse drivers decided to settle down here and take up less hazardous jobs. It offered prosperity, with its market and a constant throughput of travelers and pilgrims on the route to and from Lhasa. Today people come to buy provisions for life in the small, scattered villages of the Tibetan Plateau. There is barely a family that doesn't have ties with the caravanners. They have nostalgic tales to tell about the tea road lifestyle that is fast disappearing. Today, Wang Yuzhen has a fast food stall in the market. 
But for most of her life, she ran a caravanserai, a horse hotel. She remembers the fine livery of the horses. We would dress up the first and second mules very handsomely and hang a shining mirror and two big bells on the head of the first. The second mule would have a string of bells at its neck, decked up with flashing mirrors. They could be seen from a distance and heard from afar when the bells rung. It avoided danger. My grandmother, auntie and my mother used to be female caravan leaders. Then we opened a caravanserai. My job was to cultivate the fields to produce food for the caravanners. I chopped wood too, but I was the one responsible for receiving the caravans from the road. The rules were that I should tie up the horses correctly as soon as they got to the caravanserai and then take care of the drivers and the beasts, making sure that the accommodation was clean and everything was well organized. In this way, our good reputation would pass from mouth to mouth, so the horse drivers would come back more often. It is the eve of the Chinese New Year. This coincides with the Tibetan Spring Festival. A dozen different ethnic groups live here, and each will celebrate in its own way. Tian Shasi is Han Chinese, a local administrator, descendant of caravanners who settled here. His wife is Tibetan. Their first job today is to make sure the Chinese New Year ritual is observed. So, they need to purchase good wish papers. These Chinese wish couplets are auspicious. They will bring us good luck. They'll make us a happy and prosperous family. Oh, these are nice. Good luck again. Success, longevity, safety. Look at this one. It says every success, prosperity, and long, long longevity. <laughs> then we should buy two. Yes, why not? The family moves on to buy Tibetan prayer flags, so both cultures are respected. These will be draped from the roof of their home. Now these blue flags represent the sky. The other colors symbolize white clouds, fire, water and earth. They're the basis of our Tibetan doctrine. <laughs> In our town there are Han customs and Tibetan customs and we share festivities and ceremonies not just at New Year but all the year round, whether they be Han or Tibetan. The Han people and Tibetan people live in harmony here. Back home where the New Year preparations will begin. Their house is typical of the Han tradition and is not extensively decorated. <laughs> Mrs. Tien starts to make the celebration meal of Chinese noodles. This was not in her culture before she married, but now she is adept. Three generations of Tians live in this house. Shasi lived here with his parents before they passed away and he married. It is typically Han and Tibetan that the old are taken care of by the young, 
who will be taken care of by their children when the time comes. My grandfather drove horses from Shashi to here. He followed the road trade. I'm the 13th generation of my family, and we eventually settled down here to produce daily utensils which were needed in Tibet. So you see that for generations, the Han Chinese culture, the Western culture, and the local culture have blended together. The blend was good, and it promoted the economic development of this region. In the past, there were many, many traders from the hinterlands of China, India and Nepal, and they traded with local tea merchants who transported the tea towards the regions of Tibet. We used to carry the tea by yak and horse because at that time this area had no access to highways. So this became a major distribution center where all the peoples mixed. Shasi's granddaughter is three years old. She's been taking lessons in Tibetan dance from her Han grandfather, who's become an expert. Shasi also gives the community dancing lessons. He believes it is important to blend the ethnic groups, but not at the price of submerging any individual culture. Here, song and dance are the most popular forms of entertainment. Each town has its own little variation on the steps. The song describes the beauty of Dali and the fragrance of the tea that passes along the route. To India, that place of wonderful spices. The horse caravans spread cultures and must be thanked for the richness of life. We are more than 4,000 meters above sea level on the calm plateau. Despite the freezing, harsh conditions, people can live well here. A family's richness and prestige is rated by the number of head of yak in their herd. Each yak is worth about 200 euros, or 140 pounds sterling. In a matter of days, the loads of tea and other merchandise will be transferred from horse to yak. The yak is in its natural environment and can survive harsher conditions. After the flatlands, another region of the calm badlands. Because of the steepness, the tea road turns back on itself again and again. The caravans may serpent for 10 kilometers just to gain one kilometer in real advance.
The route passes through Mong Kong, another holy city on the plateau of Tibet. Its central point, the center of life, is the Yellow Temple. Despite the freezing air which takes the breath away, there is a constant stream of pilgrims. The devotion of these people of the highlands has not diminished. The closer to the wide skies, the greater the cold and altitude. So there is greater need for a spiritual link to the natural forces. In the past, our lamasery used to be very big. During the period that it really flourished, there were more than 200 lamas and four living Buddhas at the Weiss Monastery. The four living Buddhas would be responsible for all the expenses of the lamasery, taking the job in turns. Our major income was from the tea trade, and we collected tea from Pu'er and Yunnan, Chiagueng, Lijiang, and other tea producing centers. We'd purchase tea and rice to transport to Tibet and India. In this way, we earned enough money for our daily expenses, and this also allowed us to pay for Buddhist relics which we give away to followers. At the moment, the lamasery consumes more than 500 tuo of tea a year. That's about 20 tons. A chance to visit a truly Tibetan home, different from the surrounding Chinese houses in terms of the artistry of their decor. This may be grander than normal, but even simpler homes reflect the artistic finesse of a Tibetan civilization that has existed for more than a thousand years. A civilization rich in music, in philosophy, and in scripture. As is traditional, the women of the house make the tea in big bamboo tubes. The tea is pulverized, and the process can take up to three hours. This is the god of the stove, and it can't be found anywhere else. In the middle is the wheel of life, the deal, as we say in Tibetan. Underneath is the cat god, which arrived here from India. The Indians insisted on certain conditions before allowing us to enshrine the cat god. First, we had to promise to hold the cat god in its master's arms every day. Secondly, we had to feed the cat cod with milk every day. At that time, there was a lot of mouse activity here, and that's why we needed the cat cod. The lion is the king of animals in this snow region and in the holy mountain areas. This is the unique earth cupboard. It has a beautiful name, the Han Beauty Cupboard. The cupboard style was introduced to this region by Han craftsmen. The upper part is engraved with dragons and the phoenix. This painting is called the longevity painting. We Tibetan people pray to God to bestow longevity on us. There are very strict rules about the placement of bowls in this cupboard. Daily offerings of tea are poured for the gods, in the precise order and with everything placed according to the ancient books. A daily ritual before the moment of prayer. The caravans seek respite here. 
because afterwards lies the notorious Bangda grassland, one of the most punishing stretches of all. The Bangda grassland is a boundless area. It takes a whole week to cross the Bangda grassland by caravan. After every day's travel, you look back and you can still see the place you set out from. When we reach Bangda grassland, we fear that the horses will try to escape because this journey, when they're loaded, is really too much for horses. So normally, we would exchange the loads from horses to yaks, and they would take over the transport mission. When we reach the end of the Bangda grasslands, we transfer the loads back onto horses. The yaks arrive from villages scattered across the plain. Each man owns two or three yaks and has been invited to join the bigger caravan team. This is a major commercial way station where goods are exchanged. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've spent three days on the road to get here, and we didn't see a thing. There wasn't a car to be seen anywhere all along the road. <laughs> Yak meat and a little tea are today's load. The yak meat is weighed. It will be evenly divided between the yaks that have turned up, and the drivers will be paid accordingly. The weight is double-checked by the caravan boss and the yak drivers to ensure that there's an even distribution. All negotiation takes place around the campfire. The young chief of all the caravanners makes the calculations. He has been paid in advance by villages along the tea route that have put in their orders of tea and meat. It is the rule of the road that his drivers are paid in advance also. Finally, the lengthy calculation of payments is concluded. Food is shared equally, according to another rule of the road, to charge up their bodies for the freezing conditions ahead. A force feeding commences. Yak butter tea, salt, some sugar and milk are mixed with a form of barley to make the famous Tibetan porridge called sampa. <laughs> <laughs> to work, loading carefully so as not to overstress any single animal. It's an insurance. Like long-distance lorry haulage, the yaks and mountain buffalo have to be finely tuned and the load evenly distributed. A horse can walk 30 kilometers a day. But with a buffalo or a yak, the most I can make is 20 kilometers. Buffaloes walk relatively slowly.
。那么这种情况，大概这里都要走了一个路呢，十条路很窄的。The lead buffalo is the most important one in the team. At the many crossroads, or when a road was diverted, and there were many of these, the leading buffalo would stop and listen for the driver's instructions. If you raised your right arm, the buffalo would turn left. Raise the left arm, and it would turn right. But if the buffalo was trained well enough, it could understand the human voice. If instructions were delivered fast, the buffalo would walk faster. If something untoward happened, like a load falling off, the leading buffalo would stop and wait for a while. If you think about it, the buffalo is a very efficient animal for this type of work. When things were going well, I'd strike a gong every four or five minutes. If there was a collision between buffalo caravans going in opposite directions, it was necessary to alert those who were following behind, because on the narrow mountain paths an accident could happen. In this case, you'd strike the gong in an agitated way. It let the caravanners know that they had to get off the track and find a place to step aside to avoid this risky collision. They are called the Bangda Grassland, but maybe a better name would be the Bangda Iceland, because frozen rivulets and tarns cut the path. Even for the yaks, keeping balance is difficult. Calories are burnt up rapidly, and the going drops to around 12 kilometers a day. Seven days on, and the caravan road drops by nearly 1,000 meters to a mere 3,500. It is still difficult to breathe, but the ice falls behind. This means that Lhasa is only days away. We divert to Kongdu town, because a most important Tibetan Buddhist ceremony is about to take place here, and it only happens once in ten years. 100,000 pilgrims arrive from all over Tibet. Many have followed the ancient tea road to get here. Early morning rites inside the Kongdu temple. This place shows better than any other how early Buddhism was adapted in Tibet to absorb more ancient beliefs. Demon masks and demon clothes are reminders that their world is occupied by both good and evil spirits, and the demons have to be controlled by occult practice. <laughs> The lamas seek with their mantras and their meditation to be the teachers who will carry everyone into a harmonious spiritual state which will lead to transcendence over the world's negative influences.
The pilgrims receive the Lama's benediction, and in return, they give donations to keep their monastery alive. Such was the level of faith at one time that a quarter of the male population became Lamas. The early prayers finished, everyone gathers before the monastery. Because today, there will be a rare visit from a living Buddha, the reincarnation of a great teacher at the top of the Lamaist hierarchy. The veneration is great, because this Lama is the personification of Buddha, not at the highest level like a Dalai Lama, but as a prince of the church. There are about a hundred living Buddhas in Tibet today. He is enrobed with all the majesty of a coronation. Beneath the temple, the fires burn, because indivisibly associated with all Lamaist rituals is the element of tea. And the tea which will be served to all the hundreds of higher Lamas is made by the lesser Lamas who serve in the kitchens. The tea is brought to the temple by the novices, who dream of one day achieving the highest planes of learning. They will use ten tons of tea today. First, a meal of rice is served to the thousands of monks in attendance. For the young novices, it's an unbelievably rigorous morning. Bucket after bucket of tea has to be carried upstairs from the kitchens. <laughs> the tea is served to each adherent. This is a symbolic attachment because the trade of tea brought income to the monasteries and became a holy element in its own right. Tea is flesh, tea is blood, tea is life, they say. Lamas give offerings to their living Buddha, give thanks that the reincarnated Buddha is present among them. And now the grand climax of his visit. The living Buddha has to be dressed according to the rules of the Lamaism scriptures. For the local people, the most important moment is about to take place. He'll deliver them the guarantee of a successful harvest, prosperity for the year to come. This is the moment that will clinch the deal with the forces of nature. The living Buddha pours tea onto the flames as an offering. An excellent harvest awaits if the ritual is performed well and by the rules. Today, the auspices are good.
return to the caravans which are now approaching Lhasa. There are only several days to go, but they are worn down to the limit. They have covered more than 4,000 kilometers of absolute physical endurance for horse and man. From the 16 mountains of subtropical Yunnan in southern China to the slopes of the Himalayas, across mountain chains and four great river gorges, through Shangri-La and the high plains where the air is rarefied, and now the last stretch. So many months to arrive on the Lhasa plain and near the end of the tea road the route to the skies. Tea was the major commodity for the people of Tibet, the Bai and the Nashi, the most active on the tea road, and it took them six months to finish the journey. So the round trip to reach home again took a whole year. The road conditions were extremely dangerous. The Tibetan, the Bai, and the Nashi horse drivers really risked their lives to develop this ancient tea road. Our history was written by horsemen. The caravans converge on Lhasa. Yak and horse trains arrive from right and left. But even here, in sight of safety, there are tragic stories of those who fell foul of the ancient tea road. When I was little, I traveled the road with my father and grandfather. They were traveling up from Zhongdian and Shangri-La. I was a child of eight years old at the time, but on the way to India, I got lost. I couldn't find my family again. I wandered the streets and followed other horse caravans to India, where I stayed for three years. Then in 1956, I came back here and settled because I didn't know where my hometown was. In 1980, I heard someone singing outside my lodging, and the song sounded very familiar, so I approached him and found out that my hometown was in Shangri-La. I returned to my native place, Zhongjian, but my parents had passed away. I found my sister and stayed with her for 10 months, but I already had a wife and children here. If I hadn't, then I'd never have returned. But return he did, and 70 years have passed since his fateful story began. Lhasa is the Tibetan word for high place, and to stand before the Potala Palace is almost a moment of disbelief. It has been fixed in their minds, the objective of all their months on the tea road. It is hard to imagine that they are finally here.
For the worshippers of Tibetan Buddhism, this is the highest place. The Jokang Temple, built in 642, one of the biggest and certainly the most important in Tibet. It is their Vatican, their Wailing Wall, their Mecca. But the reason the caravans have come is that Lhasa is the huge commercial hub linking India, China, Mongolia and the world beyond. It is a city of 120,000, an administrative capital, and it has thrived because of the cross-pollination of peoples who sought to trade here. The tea merchants are everywhere. They store the loads of tea and half will be kept for local use, the rest sold on to distant clients. The price will depend, like fine wines, on the place of origin, on the altitude and soil type, on the method of production, and on the age. The best teas will mature for at least 30 years. Tea connoisseurs will pay a fortune for 100-year-old teas. But Lhasa is a place where everything can be bought and sold or bartered from tourist trinkets to religious relics, fine cloths, silks, and spices from far and wide. After their mountainous, lonely voyage, our caravanners must really believe this is paradise on earth and must be disoriented by the bustle. Pilgrims have also followed the tea road to reach Lhasa. Many of the poorest have walked to get here from the four corners of Tibet. There are about 20,000 of them a day. They touch the prayer stones set into the temple in the hope that their fortunes will finally change. And they prostrate themselves before the temple gates, their life's mission accomplished. For many caravanners as well, the mission has been fulfilled. They will rest and make the six-month journey back home to southwest China. But others will continue on the route to India, Nepal, Bhutan and Pakistan to sell their tea from where it will be shipped on to even farther markets. Ahead for these caravans lie the passes of the Himalayas and several more weeks or months of hardship. Timeless tea road, a tribute to man's endeavor, resilience, and courage. A way of life that is on the point of disappearing. Oh, 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 oh,
白白的木路赶上我啊。